Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for volunteering for the Animal Help Ukraine project. My name is Dr. Sarah Wallace. I'm the Vice President of Telehealth here at Galaxy Vets and today's training is on triage, specifically teletriage, which is a major part of what we will be doing in the Ukraine project. So why is triage so important? Because we need to understand what's happening with each pet and determine the severity of that situation so that we can come up with a plan for their care. Once we have a clear picture of a pet's needs, we can then provide medical care or advice, information, or point people to resources they need that are in their area. So today we are very grateful to have Leilani Mustilo, founder and CEO of Animal Health Link, a company out of Calgary, Canada, that utilizes registered veterinary nurses to provide teletriage support to veterinary practices across North America. Leilani is an RVT who has worked in emergency and critical care for the past 15 years. Her passion is ER medicine, and she is a self-professed triage nerd. Leilani is actively working to standardize triage in veterinary medicine to improve patient outcomes and help with practice workflows. She has a husband, three human babies, and three fur babies, two cats and a dog, who keep her on her toes. Thank you for your time, Leilani, and take it away. Awesome. Thanks for the intro, Dr. Wallace, and it is lovely to meet you all. I'm so excited to be part of this project, and um, I wanted to say a quick shout out to Galaxy Vets because uh, I think so many of us have seen what's going on in the Ukraine and have thought, like, how can I help? What can I do? And so uh, I'm just so grateful that you guys stepped up to the plate uh, and gave some of us a platform where, where we could help. So uh, thank you for that. We're, we're going to talk about teletriage today specifically. Um, now, my understanding is you guys might have multiple uh, people contacting you at once. So I really did want to make sure that we could cover how to manage multiple emergencies that happen at the same time, and specifically when we're doing that over uh, teletriage communication. So <clears throat> what we're going to talk about today, we're going to define triage specifically, the concept of it, what is it, why do we do it, how do we do it. Then we'll talk about a primary survey. So a primary survey is what's going to help us to recognize those life-threatening conditions and the ones that need immediate intervention versus ones that, that can wait a bit longer. We'll talk a little bit about decision support tools and understand both the advantages and the limitations of them, uh, how to collect a capsule history. We'll go over a bit of first aid advice as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about case reporting also. So triage itself, so this is a, a French term, uh, which basically just means to sort. Um, and what that does is it helps us to figure out the urgency of, of patient care, where it originated from battlefield medicine. Now, unfortunately, we see it a lot more with mass casualty situations. But what it does is it maximizes the number of survivors because we're able to identify which ones are in critical condition and need immediate care. Um, it's also going to help us to treat the patients in an efficient manner because we're able to categorize them and prioritize them better. Um, it can also tell us how urgently they need to be seen. This chart down here is actually a human one. Um, usually vet med, it's usually between three to five categories or, or levels of priority that we'll see. But you can see that this one has, um, uh, uh, has a, a time a attached to it as well. All right, so uh, this next section here is going to go into uh, teletriage itself. Now, teletriage is so important because it's our first point of contact with an owner. Um, I think it's really important that we recognize why, um, what we're trying to achieve here. We're not trying to figure out what is wrong with the pet. We are trying to figure out how sick are you? How soon do you need to be seen? <clears throat> Now, sometimes depending on, on, on that last question, we will, on the answer to that last question, we'll be able to give some home care advice. Sometimes we're gonna have to give first aid treatment as well. 
I don't know if you guys have this in the US, but in Canada, we have something called 811 where people can call in to talk to a nurse about non life threatening conditions and they'll triage over the phone. And then, of course, we have 911 too. So I always say that in vet med, when we're triaging, uh, we're we are kind of like both 811 and 911. So sometimes we do need to give some immediate first care, first aid care advice. Um, and then my understanding too, is that we'll have some resources in terms of uh, where the, uh, the pet owners are gonna be able to access some, some care for their pets. Um, and then just some notes too, oftentimes when owners are calling in, they're gonna be um, panicking uh, or in some type of heightened emotional state. So just make sure to be patient with them. Remember, they don't have the medical training. Some of the things that we think are common sense is just because we've been, you know, in, in the game for so long, but someone who doesn't have the medical training um, is definitely going to panic when they see certain things. Okay. So now my next test here, let's say all three of these, or no, I think I have four, all four of these, um, uh, owners with these patients are contacting you at what time uh, at the same time, which let's, let's get you to put them in order from least to most urgent. Okay. So we've got a dog that ate a chocolate bar. We've got a male cat straining to urinate. We've got uh, a staffy that's had vomiting and diarrhea for the past three days. And we've got a collie with a laceration. So put them in order of least to most urgent in the chat there. I don't know, Lilani, I want more information. <laughs> ah, Shannon, you passed the test. This was, uh, this was a trick question. <laughs> and I didn't so, even know the answer. <laughs> well, that, that, that is the trick there is that we need more information before we can decide in these situations. Um, again, this is just, I find that it happens all too often that people will look at this and just go, the blocked cat. I don't know that he's blocked though. All I know is that he is straining to urinate. Um, we don't know how long it's been going on for. It does have the potential to be life-threatening um, and also painful, uh, the, the dog, I mean, we'd have to calculate the, the dose. Um, but that is a, you know, can be a relatively quick thing to do the staffy. I mean, it's a chronic condition that has the potential to be life-threatening depending on the severity of the fluid loss. Um, the collie, where is the laceration? How deep is it? So good, good answer, Shannon, <laughs> we need more info. So, um, which moves, which uh, brings us to our next point. So this next um, topic here is the primary survey. If you remember nothing else from what I say today, remember this. <laughs> so this slide is the most important one. So a primary survey I, um, is something that I find uh, a lot of people overlook or they combine it with a TPR, but it is its own um, its own section of the triage and it's very important. What it is, is a non-diagnostic check of the major body systems. So our cardiovascular, respiratory and our neurological. Now it's called a major body system because it's one of the systems that's going to affect our patient's ability to live minute to minute. So there's other body systems that of course can become life-threatening, but when they do, it's because they've affected one of these three major body systems. Um, so there's lots of different acronyms you can use. Some people use the RAP acronym. I like the ABCD acronym. So A is for alert. So basically is, is the brain working? How, you know, is, is the patient alert and responsive? Is the brain working? So it looks at our neurosystem. Uh, we also have to have a pretty good uh, cardiovascular and, and blood circulation um, in order for the patient to be alert as well. Um, the B is for breathing. So obviously this is going to assess our respiratory system. Uh, C is for circulation. So we're primarily looking at perfusion here, um, i.e. our cardiovascular system. And D is for disability. Um, so this, uh, in practice, it usually takes 90 seconds or less. I find uh, when I'm doing a teletriage, it's maybe about two minutes 
uh, in that mark, but it's a very quick assessment. Um, and it's going to tell us is a major deterioration or even an arrest imminent in this patient. Um, so now the questions that we ask to focus on those major body systems, the first one is mentation. And I wanted to also look at, uh, we should pay attention to, I'm not sure quite how the translation is going to go, but I do find that sometimes with the uh, systems that use a translation, they don't translate medical terminology very well. And even if they do, uh, the person on the other side might not understand it. So um, the first question I'm going to ask, so my A for alert is the mentation. So uh, are they awake, i.e. conscious? Are they alert? Are they responding to their name? Any changes in behavior are all questions you can ask to assess the mentation. Um, the next one, so our B for breathing is, um, is there any respiratory effort? So I just ask a quick, you know, how are they breathing? Do they look like they're having any difficulty? Are you hearing any wheezing? Um, next, uh, C for, uh, cardio for circulation is going to be a uh, mucous membrane color. Um, we're also going to have access to people being able to send us a photo. So this is, this is great. Uh, I love being able to, uh, assess mucous membrane color with a photo because so often I find that owners misjudge the, the color. They'll tell me that it's white and I'm like, really? Cause you just told me that he's running around and playing fetch, like, can you send me a picture? And then sure enough, they're, you know, pink as can be. I think what happens is that when people lift the lip, they look right beside where their thumb is and they're like, oh, it's, it's, it's white, right? Or the opposite where they tell me it's pink and I'm like, oh, cause what you're describing and then they send it to me and I'm like, oh gosh, those are white. So uh, asking for gum color is fantastic. Also, telling them they don't have to open the mouth. So often I get a picture and the person's like yanking the, the pet's uh, jaw open. I'm like, you just got to lift the lips. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, make sure they know that, um, under circulation as well. We want to make sure that we ask, you know, um, is the patient bleeding at all? Um, and then ambulatory. So I'll just ask, are they able to stand? Are they able to walk? And when you think about it, it actually takes quite a bit to be able to ambulate. I mean, your neurosystem has to be working in order to, uh, you know, for your brain to tell your nerves what to do. Um, you need to have enough uh, blood circulating in order to, you know, disperse the oxygen around to the rest of the body, which means your respiratory system has to work too. So this is a question I ask for every single patient is, can they walk? Can they stand? Um, so, so these are the questions we want to make sure we ask to assess those major body systems. Again, it, this is just the primary survey. So I just want to know, are you going to die sometime soon? <laughs> it's basically what I'm trying to find out. Um, I also want to get a really quick capsule history, um, just to, it's, it's just brief and to the point, especially if it's a critical case. Um, I, I want to get a signalment. Sometimes if the patient is very critical and I need first aid advice, um, I, this might be a very, uh, I might skip some of these, these steps here. Um, but for the most part with a capsule history, I want to make sure I get the patient signalment, um, presenting complaint. If they know the cause, great. How long the problem's been going on for, do they have any other medical conditions going on and are they on any medications? Um, the reason I ask both of those is because sometimes people will tell me there's no current uh, conditions going on. And then when I ask about medications, they tell me that they're on like furosemide and clopidogrel. I'm like, for sure there's, there's no other um, medical conditions going on. So uh, this again, is just a capsule history. It's just a really quick, um, you know, let's get some quick information uh, so that I can kind of, uh, you know, or organize the case in my head. Leilani, can I pop in here for a second? One yeah. thing I would add to this is if you're asking about the duration of a problem and someone says, oh, it's been a week, oh, it's been two weeks. Sometimes my follow-up question is, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Or is it staying the same? And that's, I think that's, that's that a great point. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. Okay, so um, as, as we said before, you know, we've got the primary survey, we're figuring out the presenting complaint and that capsule history. Hopefully those things are going to allow you to make an assessment of where the patient is on the triage scale. So 
again, we're, we're just figuring out in this first part with the, the primary survey, are you critical, urgent, or are you stable at this time? Um, when we look at the body systems, th th this is the most to le least life-threatening um, uh, conditions here. So arterial bleeding is one we don't often get called about because they pass away often before um, you know, they can, they can get to us, but definitely we, I have had a couple times where we've been able to stop some, some major bleeding. Um, and then the next things in order are going to be respiratory system, cardiovascular, neurological of the three major body systems. And then we've got some of our other body systems, uh, on the list there as well. Um, it's, it's really nice with teletriage that the connection with us is immediate. This is one thing I find, um, that is really beneficial because once they get a hold of us, we can give them that first aid advice. And that just makes the patient outcome so much better because it's sometimes the difference between whether or not they're going to make it to the veterinarian. Okay, so for our next section, we're going to talk about a, a secondary survey. Now, this is a more focused assessment on um, the major body systems, but also other things that might be going on with the patient. I want to make note here that uh, it's really important not to become too focused on the gross physical exam findings. Um, so, you know, we've got um, obviously some, some trauma here that's gone on. Um, neither one of these conditions on their own, so, you know, the, the degloving injury or the proptosed eye are going to kill the patient immediately as long as the major body systems are not affected, right? So, so often I see that people see this and they're like, ah, I want to give you first aid advice about this. What I want to know is how did this happen? Are any of the major body systems affected? And then if, if I've decided that they're not, I can then move on to, you know, uh, talking about first aid advice for these things. Does that make sense? I know it's just human nature to be like, ah, I want to help this, but it's interesting. My, I was making this, uh, slide and my eight-year-old son, saw it and he's like, oh my God, <laughs> what's going on? But then he said, mom, I think that dog's going to be okay. The one with the proptose die. And I said, oh, how do you know? And he said, well, he's standing up and it looks like he's looking around. And I was like, you just did a primary survey and you're eight years old. <laughs> High five. So <laughs> woohoo. All right. So um, I'll break down those major body systems here and how we are going to um, uh, assess each one. Um, so the cardiovascular system, I find this picture, I had to put it in cause I just find it funny. Like, I don't know what they're listening to with this stuff. Is going, but anyways, I love chihuahuas. I have a chihuahua and I just thought the picture was funny. So, um, okay. So when it comes to cardiovascular, what I'm concerned about is hypoperfusion. The cells need oxygen. If they don't get it, they're going to die. That's the most basic way to explain it. And the way that we look for evidence of hypoperfusion is these things. Um, and I wanted to also just point out, um, I'm going to put an orange box around the things that we can do with teletriage. So um, we can take a look at the mucous membranes and the CRT, um, and then also examining the, the jugular vein too, I, I put on there as well. Um, but the mucous membranes and CRT are going to give us a, a good idea of hypoperfusion. I put um, jugular vein in there. Sometimes it's not so easy to see um, via video call, but sometimes you can. Um, the reason I put it in there is that um, sometimes if we've got some heart failure, the right, hand, or the right side of the heart is often the one that's going to uh, fail first. And it doesn't pump blood away as, as well as it should. And then so that, that blood builds up in the, um, in front of the right atrium, which is going to be right at the jugular vein. And then, so we see a protrusion of the, the jugular vein. So anyways, sometimes you can see that on, on video call, uh, if you're lucky and, <laughs> and the patient's got nice short fur. Uh, the other thing we're going to assess with the, uh, the cardiovascular system is the mucous membrane color. So I think we all know this, you know, pink is pretty normal. Um, if they're pale or white, that means low hemoglobin. So whether that's from anemia or from um, peripheral vasoconstriction. Um, our red or what we call injected mucous membranes are uh, due to peripheral vasodilation. So we can see this with an inflammatory response. Um, and then blue means we have hemoglobin, but it's not oxygen saturated. 
Um, so I kind of sped through this because I know most of us know this. And of course, we've got an exception is the chow. Um, my dog even has some like blue spots on his tongue. So uh, just always be be careful to assess what's going on there. I actually did see I've never seen this before, but I saw a, a bee sting where the uh, gums were pink, but the tongue was blue. Um, I think there was just a, a less circulation just from the swelling to the tongue, but it was so interesting because I first saw the tongue and was like, oh my God. <laughs> but uh, once I saw the gums and I could see the patient was breathing okay. So, um, and then uh, our CRT. So obviously with these red injected mucous membranes, we're going to get a very rapid CRT. Um, and our more pale mucous membranes, it's going to be going to be a lot slower. Okay, so moving on to the respiratory system. Um, I just want everybody to obviously be aware of the fragility of these patients, especially cats. Um, with cats, I actually sometimes all I do is just try to make the environment as stress free as possible. Um, I, I, I don't want to stress them out more, so I'm not going to, you know, get the owner to do anything crazy. Maybe I'll get them to put them in their, uh, carrier and just cover it with a towel until they can get to the hospital. Sometimes all we can do, um, but with the respiratory system. So some things we want to evaluate is, um, the rate, uh, which, uh, um, actually I'll talk about that later, but yeah, the rate, the effort, and um, we can sometimes see whether it's inspiratory or expiratory on a video call, which is really nice. Um, whether we're getting any paradoxical movements between the chest and the abdomen, which would indicate, you know, very severe respiratory distress. And if we're hearing any noises, um, patient positioning too. So this is really nice because all of these things I can actually assess by video call. Um, this is actually a was taken with a cell phone. You can hear poor puppy. Um, but also take note of how this patient is positioned. So it's got its elbows abducted from the rest of its body. It's got its neck outstretched. Um, you could hear an audible noise. Uh, oftentimes these patients, um, their mentation is, is going to be altered. So they're not really paying attention to, uh, the environment around them. They're just concentrating on breathing. They're not going to respond to their name. Um, some other patients, you can't see it in this video, but you might see flared nostrils or puffed cheeks, uh, when we're, when we're seeing a patient in respiratory distress. Um, some other things to note too, um, Sometimes facial injuries can interfere with the airway. Um, so just taking uh, account of any facial swelling or injuries, um, any thoracic injuries as well, and feeling for sub-Q emphysema. This was a really interesting case out of the UK that I found in a newspaper article, actually. It's a three-year-old uh, dachshund that the owners just found like this. This is all, this is his radiographs. This is all sub-Q emphysema. Um, so you can see all of the, his whole body was just full of air. Um, and so the, we can see sub-Q emphysema due to tracheal tears or chest wall defects. So what we can get the owner to do at home is to actually feel and look for those thoracic injuries. I've seen so often, especially with really furry patients that the owner just hasn't noticed, um, a, an injury to the chest wall. Um, so get them to feel for, you know, if they're feeling any crunchiness. Uh, when they touch the patient. Yeah, this is a very interesting case. <laughs> okay, and then moving on to our um, neurological um, uh, body system. So um, we want to look mainly at mentation here. So is the patient uh, alert or are they lethargic, meaning they've got less energy, but they can still be aroused by some moderate stimuli? Um, are they obtunded, meaning they're less responsive to, uh, you know, normal stimuli? Are they stuporous or totally unresponsive except for the noxious or painful stimuli? Or are they comatose where they're totally unresponsive to any stimuli whatsoever? Um, we also are able to look at their gait. I find um, this is really helpful with a video call because so often owners will say, something like, you know, I think he's paralyzed or, um, I think he's having, uh, I think he's wobbly or he's having difficulty walking or he won't move. 
Um, and so getting a video is really helpful to find out like, are you laterally recumbent or are you ataxic? Um, and, um, and you know, the, the other thing that when, when we are looking at a, the neurological system in, um, in clinic, we wanna look at the spinal integrity. Um, so, you know, the DVM is going to do their, their neuro assessment to, uh, look at the, the reflexes, uh, whether they've got deep pain and anal tone. Um, and, you know, we can look at whether they've got paresis or paralysis. However, it's almost impossible to, uh, assess spinal integrity over the phone. Um, but we can definitely look at these things here. So, um, a, a good chunk of the neurological assessment can be done, uh, through teletriage. Okay, uh, now moving on, I wanted to talk a little bit about first aid, um, because I think that this is probably the part where, um, as triagers, we maybe panic the most, because um, when this is happening, there's, there's something major going on with the pet. Um, so I wanted to go through this a little bit. Now, first aid is so important because sometimes what a pet owner does immediately after a traumatic event has occurred is going to be more important than what we're going to do as veterinary professionals in clinic, um, you know, down the line when they actually arrive. Um, so the, the first thing I want to say though, is you need to ensure that the owner can safely assist the pet, um, especially, you know, what, what is the environment like? Uh, that's going on around them at the time of the, uh, of the communication with you. Um, but also, as we all know, painful pets, even the nicest ones can sometimes bite. So really, really important that we put the, the owner's um, safety at the forefront there. Um, and then it's also helpful because we're going to be able to give some clear directions about where the nearest vet care is um, available. Um, and I'm sure Galaxy Vets will go through that with you guys too um, how, how, how they can access that care. So let's go through a few of the, the common conditions you guys might see, um, with some of these traumas. So the first one is, um, bleeding. Um, so we want to just use a clean compress. Oh, sorry. I have a typo there. Um, so that could be a towel, cloth, gauze, even feminine pads work here. Um, otherwise, you know, you can use your hands or, or fingers. Um, but the, the best thing you're going to do for bleeding is just direct pressure for 10 to 15 minutes. What's really important to say to the owners not to disturb the clot. So often people want to, like, as soon as it soaks through, they want to remove the compress and they disturb that clot and it continues to bleed. So if it does soak through, don't remove the compress. You just want to add additional layers and continue to apply that pressure. <clears throat> um, we can. Uh, sometimes in some cases, if, if the bleeding is on a limb, sometimes you're able to elevate that limb above the level of the heart. Again, if you can do it safely without the pet um, biting or, you know, uh, wiggling more. Um, dyspnea is another one we're going to see. Uh, the, the main thing that we want to do here is minimize oxygen consumption. So we want to make sure that this pet isn't walking. Uh, the owner is carrying them. They're keeping them cool so that they're not panting. Um, and if they're able to keep them in sternal recumbency, that's really helpful too, just to allow both of those lungs to expand. Um, head trauma is something we might see as well. Um, some of the things you might notice with head trauma or are, are um, unevil pupil size. Um, their mentation might be altered. You might see some depressions on the skull or just any wounds to the head at all. Um, so if the patient will allow, uh, the best thing to do in these scenarios is to elevate the head at about a 45 degree angle from the rest of the body. Um, I know that's not always possible, but especially if they're recumbent, that's that can be an easier thing to do. We want to avoid making the patient sneeze uh, just because this greatly increases intracranial pressure. Um, so oftentimes I see people wanting to, when there's a head injury, you know, there's often blood somewhere around the face and they want to clean it up um, around the nose. I just leave that nasal discharge because you might make them sneeze. Um, and then in terms of wanting to make sure that the intracranial pressure doesn't increase, we want to avoid any pressure around the neck so we can take off any collars. We're not going to walk them by the leash. 
um, if they can, you know, fashion it into, uh, I've gotten owners to fashion their leash into a harness rather than having it right around the neck. Um, and then keeping the pet as calm as possible, obviously is, is helpful as well. Um, okay, so when it comes to open wounds, um, we don't want to use any of these products. I know soap, shampoos, alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, they can be really harsh to um, open wounds and to healing tissues as well. Um, I know this is easier said than done, but try not to let them lick the wounds. Um, if they're not going to eat it, I'll sometimes have owners even put socks on um, legs or, or whatnot if the if they need that to cover the, the area in a pinch. Um, and then if it's not involving the thorax or the abdominal cavity, um, we can use a saline solution just to rinse the wound. They don't have that even just warm tap water, just especially if there's a lot of debris in that wound, uh, just to avoid complications later with an infection. But there's a nice little recipe for how a saline solution can be made uh, at home as well. Um, and then covering with um, a, a cloth or a bandage just until they can be seen. Uh, I, the caveat to this is please make sure to tell them not to put it on too tightly. We've all seen those issues in practice where an owner has tried to put on a bandage themselves and then uh, it doesn't turn out so well for that patient's toes. <clears throat> Leilani, do you have a particular way that you describe um, putting on a bandage not too tightly in, in this situation? Um, I actually send them videos. So we have um, some videos that uh, we'll refer them to. Um, there's actually some great ones on YouTube. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I, there might be one for bandaging on YouTube, but um, I, or I don't know if you guys have any in development, but I will send them videos and be like, watch this carefully. Although with the language barrier, that might be difficult here. Um, what I typically say though, uh, is that you should be able to fit, you know, a couple fingers in there. Um, is, is what I would say to uh, a student that I was teaching how to put on a bandage. So, um, and then sometimes, you know, I guess it depends on how long until they get to vet care. Um, but sometimes I'll have them actually leave the toes out partially so that we can see if the toes are spreading and swelling as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. All right. So um, impalement or penetrating injuries. Um, so a lot of people think about it as this, the big stick sticking out of a chest, um, but really it's just any foreign body that's stuck in the animal. So that could be a gunshot wound, arrow sticks, debris, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, biggest uh, thing to take home here is do not, the owner should not attempt to remove it. Um, keep the pet as calm and still as possible and try to immobilize the, the object. If you can cut it, so something like this, if you can cut it without cutting, uh, without causing more damage, i.e. it's not gonna move about in the chest cavity, um, then uh, you can try to cut it off and just leave three to six inches of it sticking out. Um, just because obviously this would be really difficult to transport this sort of uh, patient with this much of a, an object sticking out of the chest without it you know, causing more damage. Um, with the chest impalements, you want to listen for any sucking sounds. Um, th there is debate. I mean, uh, sometimes you hear of people who will say, you know, if there is uh, a sucking sound and it's like a, a gunshot wound, for example, um, you could take, uh, some lotion or lube or whatever you have available, um, and just kind of make a circle around there and then take a piece of plastic wrap or cut a piece of a plastic bag or whatever, and put it over top of that area, um, just to make kind of a makeshift chest wall. There's debate with that because there is concern for attention pneumothorax. If you are, you know, if there is any injury to the lungs itself, and then you're going to trap that uh, air in the pleural space anyways. So, I mean, th there's two sides of the coin there, but, but that is, that is something that I've seen some people do. Um, okay, so burns. Um, if this is a chemical burn, you want to make sure to just brush off any dry chemicals. Obviously, do not use bare hands for this. Um, and then, uh, honestly, with burns, immediate cooling for like the first 10 to 20 minutes is probably the most important thing um, in terms of allowing that tissue to survive. Um, so we are going to just pour some cool water over the area for again, 10 to 20 minutes. 
Uh, what that does is just lessens the depth of the burn and it also relieves pain for the patient as well. Um, after that, you can just continue with cool water compresses with a clean cloth to the site. Um, you can change the cloth as needed and, and that's just gonna keep the site cool and wet. Um, and you can continue that for the first, at least the first 30 minutes um, of the, when the burn happened. Um, another really nice thing is just um, plain old plastic wrap actually um, to, <laughs> to cover. I, I actually have one of these in my car just because I, I find so many uses for it when it comes to, um, <laughs> when it comes to first aid, but um, you can cover the burn with the plastic wrap until they're able to be seen. Uh, what the plastic wrap does is just maintains the moisture there to allow that tissue to survive. Um, and it protects the exposed nerve endings um, and it reduces the risk of like bandage material sticking to it. There's actually a study done to look at, um, does covering burns with plastic wrap um, increase infection and the, and, and the conclusion was that it doesn't, there's very low risk for infection using plastic wrap versus, um, you know, a, a traditional, uh, first aid bandaging. Um, and then these patients can lose heat very quickly, depending on how, uh, large the burn is. So just make sure to cover them with a blanket as well. Um, with the burns, you might see some blistering really important that you leave those, um, blisters alone, don't open them. The blisters are actually going to protect the burn from um, infection and they're also going to reduce pain as well. Um, most burns should heal within 10 days if they're minor. Um, but uh, again, if they're not, then uh, that might be something we want to ask these, these owners to call us back about or to contact us about again. Any questions about any of those those are the, the, the first aid ones that first came to mind that we might, we might see um, with these patients um, and the traumas that we might see. Any questions with those? All right, we'll move on. So um, tying it all together, the way that I usually uh, will run through a teletriage is that I will introduce myself first um, and I'll introduce myself as an, as a, a veterinary nurse and explain what my role is, because otherwise sometimes what the person on the other end thinks is that I'm the veterinarian and I'm going to give them a diagnosis and tell them where to pick up some pills. So, um, I always make sure to say what my, what, what my, um, scope of practice is, what my, um, what my role is in the triage. Uh, and then setting an agenda. This is some a tip that I learned uh, that has been so helpful. It not only prepares the owner for what you're going to talk about, but it also organizes your thoughts. Um, because again, we're only human. When somebody calls in panicking uh, and frantic, sometimes you know we can start to feel panic and frantic. So setting an agenda helps me to organize my thoughts and think, okay, um, this is what I need to do. I need to do this first and that. Um, and so. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what that looks like in a minute. So remember that we are going to um, uh, collect the history. We're going to do the primary survey, which is going to assess the major body systems. And then we're going to do the secondary sur survey, which is going to, to have that further questioning to determine the urgency. So uh, the way that I typically say it to the owner is, you know, my name's Leilani. I'm a veterinary nurse. Um, I am, and I'm here to help. I am uh, going to ask you a few questions here or a series of questions that's going to help me better determine how urgent your pet is and how soon they need to be seen. Um, and so that just lets them know, you know, what to expect from me. And I'll say, but I'm going to start off just by asking you um, a few questions about what's been going on. I do leave the history as a, an open question, just because I find that sometimes what the owner's presenting complaint is or what they're most concerned about is not what I'm most concerned about from a medical standpoint. So I do leave that open so that I can hear the full picture. Um, and then when we're doing some of our other triage questions, we can have more of closed questioning. But um, yeah, so um, setting an agenda is huge when it comes to uh, organizing your thoughts and also letting the person on the other end know uh, how the, the consult is going to go. Um, so I put this in here. I'm not sure how much of how much reporting will be done with these cases, but I thought 
why not? We'll put it in here. Um, so um, I will often get the patient details, which are going to include the signalment, but also the presenting complaint, um, any pertinent medical history and current medications. Uh, so this is, you know, essentially the, the a lot of the capsule history. Um, and then I actually wrote, wrote, do my reports in a SOAP format. Now our SOAP format as nurses are gonna be very different than what uh, a DVM SOAP is going to be. Um, well, not super different. I would say the S and the O are pretty much the same, but the A and the P are different. So um, our subjective is going to be our patient history and the presenting complaint. Our objective is going to be our observable indicators slash our findings. So, uh, this is where I'll, I'll put in what the primary survey, what I saw in the primary survey and what some of the answers to my triage questions were from the owner. Um, and then our assessment, whereas a DVM's assessment would be their diagnosis or their differential diagnoses, ours as the RVTs or the, the nurses um, is just how urgently does the patient need to be seen? I call this a triage disposition. So how soon do I want this patient seen? Um, and then the plan. So uh, whereas the DVM's plan in a SOAP might be, you know, uh, the treatment plan, i.e. surgery, prescriptions, that sort of thing. Uh, for us, it's going to be what's the next step for the patient and the owner? Do I need to give them first aid advice? Can I give them some home care and monitoring instructions? Or do I need to tell them to, uh, you know, go seek immediate vet care? So that will right. be that will be definitely very important for all of our nurses. Everyone who's triaging will be a, a format very similar to this um, to exactly what Leilani said in terms of the the assessment and the plan. But um, one of the other main uh, applications will be if we need to escalate this to a doctor for a certain situation doctor needs to put eyes on the case, we could have a little, little soap like this so that as soon as the doctor picks up that case, they'll be able to understand exactly what's happening and keep moving forward. Perfect. That's awesome. Um, okay. So a couple other things I just wanted to mention when it comes to triage is just to remember the context. So if the injury that you're seeing or the presenting complaint that the owner has is not fitting with the rest of the clinical signs you're seeing, look for other problems. Um, you know, the, the owner might think that, you know, uh, the, the problem is just that he started having diarrhea today, but the, the patient seems way too obtunded or, you know, something else is going on, then um, we might need to look for, for other problems as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you guys a real test. So let's say all of these, uh, uh, patients, owners contact you at the same time. Um, and we get a primary survey done. And the, this is what we find out from our primary survey. Uh, tell me what order you would put these patients in. We'll say uh, from the most, uh, the, the highest acuity triage level. So the most uh, life-threatening to the least. LOM is level of mentation. People always ask me that. I didn't realize it's not, <laughs> not a common um, abbreviation. There's no letters or numbers. Did you want them A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four? Oh, sorry. Or... Yes, I didn't put that there. We no. could just say, um, yeah, we'll just go uh, A, B, C, D, starting from the top. So again, we're going to go most life-threatening to least life-threatening. Okay. 
looks like a lot of you guys are on the same page. Okay, so um, so what I would say um, is, I think most of you got that the Shih Tzu is um, gonna be number one there. Uh, there's a, a few things going on here. We've got uh, moderate respiratory effort. So our respiratory system is affected. And if we uh, remember from our other slide, it goes respiratory, cardiovascular, neurological, when it comes to um, most to least life-threatening affected major body systems. Um, the mucous membranes are pale, so um, possibly a cardiovascular compromise, uh, the patient's lethargic, and they're also non-ambulatory. So all of those things combined uh, puts, puts that uh, Shih Tzu to the top of the list. Um, oh, and I also, I, sh I should have explained this abbreviation too, is big dog, little dog. Some people, <laughs> some people also ask me that. Um, okay. And then, uh, the next one I would put on there is actually, uh, D. So the, the feline that is vomiting and lethargic, um, again, this patient is, uh, lethargic, but the, uh, mucous membranes are pale. And also, uh, the patient is, is ambulatory, but seems weak. So we've got, um, at least a couple major body systems affected there. Um, next would be the, uh, obstructed cat or possibly obstructed cat excuse me, um, no respiratory effort and, um, it's ambulating normally. Um, but just because of the nature of the problem and the presenting complaint, um, I, I put, uh, this cat next. And then at the, the bottom of our list is our Frenchie, um, who is vomiting and lethargic, but, uh, doesn't look like any major body systems are affected. So again, just, just to point out, like we've got two patients here that are, uh, have the same um, uh, have the same presenting complaint, but they are on very different levels of the triage acuity scale because of uh, the primary survey that we took there. All right, we'll do one more. So we'll do A, B, C, D again, or one, two, three, four works as well. So we've got Poyo, he's a 13 year old male neutered Weimaraner that has some swelling of the ear. Um, we have Bart, a 12 year old male neutered domestic short hair, uh, who we know ingested a, a linear foreign body previously and is now vomiting. We've got Tara, a three year old domestic medium hair who is dyspneic, and we don't know why. Um, and we have Levi, a one year old intact male German shepherd dog who has been hit by a car. Okay. So we've got a few in the chat. Okay. It looks like everybody's kind of, kind of on the same page here. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, C. So Tara would be, uh, first she, all of her ABCDs are affected. Um, and again, she is dysmic. And so, um, as you remember, respiratory, um, trumps the rest of the major body systems. Um, we have, um, and the next would be, uh, Bart. So, uh, B, so, uh, he has a, his ACD is affected, right? So he's, uh, he's not as alert. He's obtunded. Um, he's got injected mucous membranes, um, and he is non-ambulatory, uh, sorry. He's yes. He's non-ambulatory. Um, he can stand, but he's, he's too weak to walk. Um, next we would do, uh, Levi, um, Levi, although he's currently stable, um, just if we tie in his presenting complaint that could change really quickly. Um, as we all know, with those hit by cars that seem fine in, in the beginning, and then later on, <laughs> uh, show their true colors. And then Mr. Poyo here, we're going to drop obviously to the bottom here, um, because none of his major body systems are affected and his, um, uh, presenting complaint is, is definitely lower on that um, acuity scale. Now, that being said, I know we always like to talk about ear infections as, um, you know, like, oh, they're so far down on the list. But if you have, if a patient has an ear infection that is affecting the neuro system, then yeah, that definitely, you know, bumps them up. So that's why we always want to make sure that we are combining our um, primary survey along with our um, 
uh, with our uh, secondary survey, but also the presenting complaint. So they all have to tie in together, not just not just presenting complaint and, and you go here, you go there. Because um, as we all know, we could really miss a patient who is uh, unstable, but just if we're only looking at that presenting complaint, it kind of gives us that tunnel vision and, and we think we know something that we might not know. So um, yeah, so I think that's all I have on my side. I'd love to field any questions from you guys, or if you wanted me to explain any slides more, I'm happy to do that. Eilani, hey, one thing I wanted to add to your last comment when we were talking about the penis swelling was um, these are situations where ideally we would be able to send pets to um, uh, veterinary hospitals in their area. Um, a lot of those animal hospitals are overwhelmed. So sometimes we're going to be dealing with situations where we're going to have to provide them with some advice until they can get in to see that veterinarian. So um, it's it's not going to be the regular seeing the ear infection or the penis swelling in a in an ER setting and, and like sending them somewhere else at some point. Like at some point we have to get creative as a team, as a volunteer team to say, how can we provide some care now and then get them where they need to be? So we can do that as a team. Yeah, that's perfect. And I think um, uh, that, that's a really good point because um, what we are, are trying to say with the, the triage is, um, is just, it's more so who do I need to, um, assess first, you know, over the, um, over the chat. So if I've got all of these patients, which one am I going to deal with first? But yeah, you're absolutely right. We still need to, uh, get some access to care for the patients who are lower on the acuity scale. Um, whether that's access to care through us, giving some home care advice or sending them elsewhere. Um, but it's nice to know, kind of organize your thoughts and prioritize which one of these patients do I need to deal with first. Any other questions for me? Sorry if you already said this earlier, but do we get a copy of, of the slides you went through just in case we wanted to review anything? Oh, I can certainly make those available. I, I uh, uh, yeah, I can definitely do that. Thanks. It's a great presentation. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was great uh, chatting with you guys. And again, um, just want to thank Galaxy Vets for making this whole thing possible. I'm super excited to see um, uh, how many, you know, animals and owners we're going to be able to help in this situation. So can't wait to see it. Anyone else have any questions for Leilani? No. I don't have any questions, but I would just like to say thank you. Um, you know, this is amazing what you've put together and it's gonna help us a lot to be able to deliver on what uh, help we need to do for for these pets in the Ukraine. And uh, thank you for for getting this started with with Dr. Sarah, appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, nice Sarah, I'm glad to see your RVT brain is back in action. <laughs> <laughs> dust, like, dust it off a little bit, dust it off a little bit, but she's back. <laughs> right. It's like, it's like riding a bike. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I really liked it. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, I, I agree. Oh, wow. I agree, Shannon, wholeheartedly. Thank you so much, Leilani, for sharing your wisdom and your expertise in this area. We super appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Well, let me know if anybody does come up with any other questions uh, afterwards. And I'm, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so yeah, much. Bye-bye. No